Welcome to another sociology class. It's nice to have you, and I am happy that we are able to do this study to enlighten and inform one another. Because the lecturer or presenter or the um, facilitator does benefit from the exercise as well. He learns and he's refreshed and so on. Does exercise, does benefit from the exercise. So I'm happy to have you. And I give God thanks to the system that enables this um, class to take place. Let us pause the prayer. <coughs> Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the participants in this course. Thank you for the system you have given me and us to uh, impart this information. Thank you, Lord. I pray, Mary God, that you lead, that you bless. I pray you strength me physically, mentally, spiritually, and in every way. In the precious name I pray, amen. So we have been looking at the introduction of sociology. And we have gone six classes. Now this is our seventh class. And we are going to pick up where we left off the last class, the development of modern science provided the model of knowledge needed for sociology to move beyond the early moral, philosophical, and religious types of reflection on the human condition. Do you get the, um, the essence of what is being said? Sociology is a younger discipline than philosophy and religion. Before the advent of modern science and the model of social knowledge which is termed sociology. Everything was explained philosophically and, and religious in a religious way. If it was philosophical, if the person didn't have a philosophical theory or explanation, you would find some religious explanation. So, um, human condition was always reflected in, through the lenses of philosophy, morality, religion. Now that we have social, this social um, science called sociology is no longer so. Key to the development of science was the technological mindset that Max, Max Weber, Weber termed the disenchantment of the world. Disenchantment of the world. Principally, there was no mysterious calculable forces that come into play. But rather one can, in principle, master all things by calculation. Modern science abandoned the medieval view of the world in which God, the unmoved mover, defined the natural and social world as a chainless, cyclical creation ordered and given purpose by divine will, as religion. And the fact that so there is social science doesn't mean that you rule God out, but there are other... It, off, it offers other explanations. offers other explanations. What people could not understand, they just say God. And you have Christians today who behave that way, you know, because they are grounded in the Bible, just the Bible. And they shut themselves out from other information and knowledge. 
they shut themselves out from them. And so it is just God. And I'm not saying God is not in everything, but things can be explained mathematically and by so doing psychologically. God is the source, of course. But things can be explained philosophically and biologically. <laughs> so, instead, instead, modern science combined two philosophical traditions that had historically been at odds. Modern science has combined two philosophical traditions which had historically been at odds. Plato's rationalism and Aristotle's empiricism. I am an empiricist. Rationalism sought the laws that govern the truth of reason and ideas. Rationalism. And in the, the hands of early scientists like Galileo and Newton found its highest form of expression in the logical formulations of mathematics. So mathematics, mathematics explains, and it is a science, it is not a 100% precise science, But it is logical, one and one made two, and it goes on. Now, empiricism sought to discover the laws of the operation of the world through the careful, method methodical, methodical, and detailed observation of the world. Again, I read this again. Empiricism sought to discover the laws of the operation of the world to the careful, methodical, and detailed observation of the world. Observation is empiricism. That's the real experience. The new scientific worldview, therefore, combined this clear and logical, coherent, conceptual formulation of propositions. Again, the new scientific worldview therefore combined the clear and logical, coherent, conceptual formulation of propositions from rationalism with an empirical method of inquiry based on observation to the senses. The senses. What you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you experience, what you feel. Observation through the senses. Sociology adopted these core principles to emphasize that claims about society had to be clearly formulated and based on evidence-based procedures. So they take a, a history takes that evidence-based procedure as well. And Social, according to these scholars and professors, sociology adopted these core principles. What are the core principles? The new scientific worldview, therefore, combined the clear, logical, coherent, conceptual formulation of propositions from rationalism with an empirical method of inquiry. So it's not just rational, rationalism but empiricism and empirical method of inquiry based on observation through the senses. So sociology adopted these core principles to emphasize the claims about society. The emergence of democratic forms of government in the 18th century demonstrated that humans had the capacity to change the world. Ah, 
God did put humans here to take charge. The rigid hierarchy of medieval society was not a God-given eternal order, but a human order that could be challenged and proved upon through human intervention. Society came to be seen as both historical and a product of human endeavors. Age of Enlightenment philosophy, philosophers like Locke, John Locke, and Voltaire maintain and Rousseau developed general principles that could be used to explain social life. The emphasis shifted from these histories and exploits of the aristocracy to the life of ordinary people. Mary Wollstonecraft, a vindic and this is her work, A Vindication of the Right of Woman, 1792, extended the critical analysis. Extended the critical analysis of her male enlightenment contemporaries extended that an enlightenment period is not the same as the renaissance they're not the same it was a different period no no in western europe but it was really in western europe because by then the eastern world had been eclipsed to a large extent of course the ottoman empire was still was still around but the Arab Caliphate had been demolished, with Baghdad being the capital. That had been demolished by the the um, that those of you well you would see it in world history that the there is a group and a group is that named. From Asia, the, the Central Asia. There was this ethnic group from Central Asia that overran large sections of Asia, like India, the Middle East, and Europe. It, it demolished Russia to a large extent and was threatening Western Europe. The rest of Western Europe. But Russia is not considered to be Western Europe. But it was um, checked in Western Europe. <coughs> that same group demolished the Ottoman um, Empire and Baghdad. Um, so her work was 1792. The Ottoman Empire lasted up, and up until 14, 9, 14, 1914, 1914, World War II. It didn't survive World War II. <coughs> Significantly, for modern sociology, 
They propose that the use of reason could be applied to address social ills and to emancipate humanity from servitude. Wall Stonecraft, for example, argued that simply allowing women to have a proper education would enable them to contribute to the improvement of society, especially, especially through their influence and children. On the other hand, the blood experience Bloody, uh, I'm, I'm assessing something here. Experience of the democratic revolutions. On the other hand, the bloody experience of the democratic revolutions, particularly the French Revolution, which resulted in the reign of terror. There was what if you read on the French Revolution, you're going to see what is called the reign of terror. And ultimately, Napoleon's attempt to subjugate Europe. Napoleon came in the late 1800s, came to power, and consolidated his position. Not 1800, he came to power in the late 1700. It was 1789 to early 1800. And he ruled for about 15 years, and it was pure war. He sought to subjugate Western Europe, or Europe, Europe, because he um, invaded Russia. Also provided a cautionary tale for the early sociologists about the need for sober scientific assessment of society. Address social science, to address social science. The industrial to address social science. And social problems, social problems. The Industrial Revolution <coughs> in a strict sense refers to the development of industrial methods of production. The indus introduction of industrial machinery and the organization of labor in view of manufacturing systems. These economic changes emphasize the massive transformation of human life brought about by the creation of wage labor. Capitalist competition increased mobility, urbanization. So we're talking about rev uh, the Industrial Revolution which brought about economic changes and dislocation and economic uh, breakthrough for, for, for some. These economic changes emblemize the massive transformation of human life brought about by the creation of waste labor. Unlike what have obtained on the feudal system. It brought up both also capitalist competition. And more so now that factories and companies will have to continue to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade and upgrade in order to have that competitive edge. And it brought about it has brought about also increased mobility because ships cars, urbanization, towns begin to spread, individualism, people begin to look out for themselves and families. And 
all the social problems they, they, they wrought. They, along, they, these, and along with the social problems they wrought. What, are the social, what were the social problems? Poverty, because some became very poor. Um, for example, when prior to the Industrial Revolution, weaving was done in the house. The factory was in the house. And the factory employed 400 people, 500 people. When locomotive was invented and people started to set them up and use them, the factory workers, employers, the factory owners found that they didn't need so many hands. So they, they would lay off 400 and um, people keep 50, keep 30. And they were able to make better quality cloths, cheaper cloths, and more cloths within the same time frame. So they were able to save more money because they had fewer people to pay. Those people who lost their jobs became poorer. So it created poverty. And then the factory conditions were not good, so exploitation. Dangerous working conditions. Crime. Those who lost a job turned to crime. Filth. The factories were not properly set up and the conditions were not good. Disease. Because of overcrowding and so on, people were coming from the rural districts coming into the town to know town life and to find what, what um, to experience town life, I said. So, as a result, they had overcrowding and the loss of family and other traditional support networks. It was a time of great social and political upheaval with the rise of empires that exposed many people. For the first time, to societies and cultures other than their own, people were exposed to, people were coming from the deep rural areas and became exposed to empires, urbanization, cities, town life, city life, and Lord, they didn't want to go back. Many of them left families, women and children, to come to the urban area to earn a living and became lost and start new families. <laughs> yes. Millions of people were moving into cities and many people were turning away from their traditional religious beliefs. Wars, strikes, revolts, and revolutionary actions were reactions to underlying social tensions that had never existed before and called for critical examination. August Comte, in particular, envisioned the new science of sociology as the antidote to conditions that he described as moral anarchy. You're going to come up on that term again, moral, moral anarchy. And remember that it was a coinage of August Comte. Don't forget. Sociology therefore emerged as an extension of the new worldview of science, as part of the Enlightenment project and its appreciation of historical change, social injustice, and the possibilities of social reforms and as a crucial response to the new and unprecedented types of social problems that appeared in the 19th century. Antidote means it will kill the bacteria. It did not emerge as a unified science, however, as its founders brought distinctly different perspectives to its early formulations. This person 
spoke on something, you know, well, it, it, it term, apparently the term did not even exist as yet, but it spoke to something, and somebody responded to it, and, you know, so you have the different perspectives coming into being. The term sociology was first coined, all right, by, in 1780 by the French essayist Emmanuel Joseph Sees, S-I-E-Y-E-S. Eighteen, seventeen, eighteen, and um, this essay was born in seventeen forty-eight, and died eighteen thirty-six. <coughs> he lived. I mean, by comparison with the others. Um, in an unpublished manuscript, so that's how it was termed. So, so the term was first coined. In 1780, by Emmanuel. Joseph. In 1838, The term was reinvented by August Comte. The contradictions of Comte's life and the times he lived through can be in large part read into the concern that led to his development of sociology. He was born eighteen it was born seventeen ninety eight, year six of the new French Republic. Because the, the revolution started in 1789 in France. So, this is 17, so you had the new French Republic in 1798. So, staunch monarchists, Catholic parents. So, he was born to monarchists, Catholic parents, who live comfortably on the father's earnings as a minor bureaucrat in the tax office. Comte originally studied to be an engineer, but after rejecting his parents' conservative views and declaring himself a Republican and free spirit at the age of 13, he got kicked out of school at age 18 to leading a school ride, which ended his chances of getting a formal education and a position as an academic or government official. I didn't know you had that being a rebellion that early in those days. So like now, so like now, but not now. He became a secretary of the utopian socialist philosopher, Claude Henry D. Rove Rowe, D. D. Comte D. Saint Simon, until they had a falling out in 1824. After Saint Simon, perhaps, purloins of Comte's essays and signed his own name to them. Nevertheless, they both thought that society could be studied using the same scientific methods utilized, utilized in the natural sciences. Comte also believed in the potential of social scientists to work toward the betterment of society and coined the slogan, Order and Progress, to reconcile the opposing progress, 
progressive and conservative factors, factions that had divided the crisis ridden post revolutionary French society. Comte proposed a renewed organic spiritual order in which the authority of science would be the means to reconcile the people in each social strata, each social stratum, with their place in the order. It is a testament to his influence that the phrase order and progress adorns the Brazilian coat of arms. We'll have to cut here for today. Do your reflection and email me. God bless you.